Welcome to a special episode of the new Thinking for a New World podcast series focused on leadership. Today's world is short of a lot of things, hope, peace, prosperity. But what it lacks most is dynamic, innovative, global, values-based leadership. If we can find or nurture the right leaders, the rest will follow. Listen as two great leaders, human rights lawyer Jared Genser and photographer and storyteller Shahid Al Alam discuss how great leaders can change everything. Hi, Jared.、Uh, I've been meaning to get in touch with you for a long time, so this is a great pleasure for me and an opportunity. But no, it's kind of unusual to find a human rights lawyer who's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Um, the term extractor is a word one associates more with a dentist or, or perhaps Arnold Schwarzenegger.、Uh, but political prisoners like me will appreciate the moniker given by the New York Times: protecting individual rights against those who would deny them. What you do, and you do it persuasively in a strategic manner, and you're tenacious. And you talk about、uh, an asynchronous. Philanthropy model, small investments, large returns. In terms of time and effort, they seem huge investments. Well, well first of all, thank you,、uh, Shahadul, for、um, interviewing me, and to Talbert, of course, for the award.、Uh, I know you were a former political prisoner yourself、uh, for many months, and you know exactly、uh, the importance of the kind of、uh, work that I do, and everything I do, I do for people exactly like you who. Uh, at great risk to themselves,、uh, stand up to authoritarian regimes, knowing that their their lives and security could be at stake.、Uh, yes, this is of course enormous investments of time and work.、Uh, some of my、uh, my hardest cases can take thousands of hours if you're looking at individual political prisoner cases.、Uh, and I've learned over the course of my career now, some twenty years, having done fifty cases of this kind from start to finish.、Uh, How complicated it is to find the right set of legal, political, and public relations advocacy efforts to get my clients out of jail.、Uh, every case is different. Every country is different.、Um, but there are obviously、uh, common approaches that one can undertake、uh, to try to get that done. But it can be very, very difficult and undoubtedly very, very time-consuming. Well, apart from the fifty or so cases, you've also written over a hundred and eighty op-eds.、Uh, <laughs> I have no idea. Drawn to that, but you say you've never represented someone without having been asked.、Uh, there've been some very high-profile names:、uh, Vaclav Havel, Aung San Suu Kyi,、uh, San Suu Kyi, Desmond Tutu,、uh, Anwar Ibrahim, Mohammad Nasheed.、Uh, but I'm curious about one of them:、uh, about Aung San Suu Kyi.、Uh, right. How would you reflect on what she's become? Her relationships with the junta, a denial of what is happening. You've had spectacular successes. Will you reflect on where you may perhaps have failed? <laughs> sure. So,、um, well, look. I mean,、uh, I represented Aung San Suu Kyi from 2005 to 2010.、Um, the latter five years that she was under house arrest, and my my work on her behalf ended the day that、uh, she walked out of house arrest. Uh, obviously, I think, like many in the international community, I've been、uh, really deeply disappointed and uh, uh, and saddened and horrified by、uh, the genocide denial that、uh, that she and the Burmese、uh, junta have、uh, demonstrated、uh, in recent years with respect to the Rohingya、uh, ethnic and religious、uh, minority group in the country, and. You know,、uh, as a human rights lawyer, I call it as I see it, and I speak truth to power、uh, whenever it is necessary to do so. That case has been harder for me because, as her former lawyer,、um, I have an unfair advantage, and so it's been very、uh, to be able to speak out against her, and that has limited what I've been able to say. In fact, this is probably more than I've said publicly、uh, than in, in any other fora,、um, simply because, again, I have、um, uh, an unfair advantage、uh, in. Criticizing her.、Uh, when it comes to failures, unfortunately, I think、uh, all of us、uh, who have worked in any field for many years and seen some success、uh, find that、uh, success is only built on the back of many failures. <laughs>、um, so that has undoubtedly been my case too.、Um, if I think of my largest failure, 
and a very high profile one. Uh, it was my uh, my work over uh, literally over six, seven years to try to get uh, the Chinese Nobel Peace Laureate Liu Xiaobo uh, out of prison in China. Um, I actually began representing him about six months before he won the Nobel Peace Prize and then was his representative to the Norwegian Nobel Committee, uh, along with a former client of mine who had been a political prisoner in China, Yang Zhenli. And, you know, it was an extraordinary day to see the award presented to the empty chair. And I knew at that moment it was going to be a very, very difficult and long slog. I got to know his wife, Liu Xia, um, and we spent years doing everything possible that you can imagine uh, to try to get him out, you know, testifying in a dozen parliaments, uh, you know, 20, 25 op-eds in newspapers, winning their cases at the United Nations, you know, one point getting a letter from more than 100 Nobel laureates across the five disciplines uh, to uh, send to, uh, to Xi Jinping. And ultimately, all of that uh, failed uh, to ultimately get him out of jail before he, uh, he died of, uh, of liver cancer in a, uh, in a Chinese hospital. So, I mean, it, that was undoubtedly the, the worst day of my life professionally. Um, when he died, uh, obviously, I, I'm not responsible for his death. The Chinese government is responsible for his death and the world failed him. Uh, but as the only person actually, you know, signed by him and his family to represent him, there's no way to look at what happened uh, other than as a, as a very painful failure. Well, I wouldn't say that. And I'm sure he wouldn't have seen it that way. But you know, you're not new to this business. You were a young global leader of the World Economic Forum from 2008 to 2013. You've moved mountains, as you did in this case, to try and release the people who've championed. Uh, now, the Tolberg Secretary General of the Organization of American States, Louis Almagro, has asked you to be the volunteer diplomat in the post of special envoy uh, on the responsibility to protect. What is next for you? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a very exciting new position that I've taken on, um, and it's really about following through on the commitment of all member states of the United Nations in 2005, which adopted this doctrine uh, called the Responsibility to Protect, which is about uh, the obligation of all states to prevent and respond to mass atrocity crimes. And so I've been hired in this post to help develop a regional system uh, uh, within the Latin America region uh, to uh, help the organization become more effective at that kind of prevention work. A number of years ago, there would have been no thought that this was a real issue or concern in the region. But starting in 2014, the situation in Venezuela uh, began to deteriorate substantially. And today, there are enormous alleged crimes against humanity taking place in that country. And just this week, uh, or just last week, I released a report, uh, my first report in this role for the OAS, that not only found that crimes against humanity were being committed in Venezuela, uh, but also I had no choice but to speak truth to power as it relates to what the ICC prosecutor, uh, Fatou Ben Souda, uh, has been doing with this case at the International Criminal Court. Um, and unfortunately, she began a preliminary examination to the situation uh, back in February of 2018, and almost three years later now, has yet to even open a formal investigation into uh, the crisis uh, in Venezuela and these alleged crimes, uh, which, in my view, is an abdication of responsibility on her part in light of uh, numerous ways that we document that she has failed to follow through on her stated commitments uh, to how she conducts these kinds of examinations. And this has resulted in greater impunity in Venezuela and a belief by Nicolas Maduro and his regime that uh, that they can commit whatever crimes they want with total impunity. Uh, and so this is much of the kind of things I do in lots of different roles that I've uh, had in my career. Um, and luckily, in this particular case, I have an extraordinary um, and visionary leader that I work with uh, on this, uh, Louis uh, Almagro of the uh, Organization of American States, who has been an outspoken uh, uh, advocate for freedom, democracy, and human rights in Venezuela. Um, and also for the importance of this particular doctrine, the responsibility to protect. Do you know leaders that sound like these? Leaders, young or old, who are changing the world, who are not content with what is and are willing to work for what could be. If so, nominate them for the Talberg SNF Eliasson Global Leadership Prize at talbergprize.org. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G prize.org.
Were you ever, ever approached by Julian Assange? Uh, if you had, would you have, how would you have responded? I say <laughs> this because in many of the cases, you've pitted yourself against autocratic regimes. You've talked of getting states to live up to their commitments. But your own country, which has presented itself as a champion of freedom, goes against descenders and whistleblowers. Where do you position yourself? I would say my true north is, you know, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights uh, and international human rights law. Uh, and when it comes to civil and political rights, uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is a treaty that the United States is a party to, along with most countries in the world, covering about 90 percent of the world's populations. More than 175 countries have signed and ratified that treaty. So, uh, you know, the reality is for me, there are uh, millions of people in the world who are arbitrarily detained, but that doesn't make them political prisoners. And by that, what I mean is as follows. Um, you can be detained uh, as exactly you were for your work, right? Which is, you know, a violation of your right to freedom of opinion and expression, peaceful assembly, uh, and these kinds of rights. Um, and, uh, and when that happens, that makes you uh, a political prisoner. Um, but Often what accompanies those kinds of uh, detentions is also a you know, severe set of violations of your due process rights um, as a criminal defendant, uh, you know, the right to uh, an independent and impartial uh, you know, uh, um, judge, a, the right to the presumption of innocence, the right to access to counsel, the right to prepare and present a defense. Um, and so um, if I look at Julian Assange's case, um, I think there were some violations on uh, the due process side, but as a lawyer, that isn't sufficient for me to just be willing to take up any case. You know, I really want, uh, you know, I really only represent political prisoners when it comes to these kinds of questions. Um, and so while I appreciate that what perhaps he would describe himself as doing at, is exercising his free speech rights, uh, his right to freedom of opinion and expression, you know, when he made that massive document dump from WikiLeaks of all the State Department cables, you know, they were not redacted and they put thousands of people's lives at risk in a wide array of ways. Um, and while he may have had a right to do that um, as a matter of freedom of opinion and expression, um, you know, I don't have to like, you know, what, uh, what, what a particular person does or the way that they approached it. Um, and, you know, ultimately, uh, the, the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, which is a body that I uh, had, had become a real expert at, at practicing before and published a, a book late last year on it, um, you know, it found that he was being arbitrarily detained in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Uh, frankly, that was one of a very small number of working group opinions over the years that I strongly disagreed with um, because the working group itself said, uh, has said before that, uh, uh, that the definition of house arrest is where you are kept in closed premises and physically unable to leave. And this was not the case in my view with, with Julian Assange. Uh, my view is that uh, he voluntarily walked into the mission to escape being uh, extradited anywhere for any alleged crimes, and he could have walked out at any time. And so for me, this would not have qualified as an arbitrary detention uh, as such. Uh, we're short of time, so I've got to make this short. You are a high-flying lawyer, but a lot of the work you do is pro bono. You had your eye on the big prize, but the way you defined it was having the biggest impact possible and leverage and the most support to do that. Clearly an intense person. Are you a difficult person to work with? Uh, a lot of very intense people are. And if there is time, and we have very little, tell us a little bit about your new film. When you talk about if I'm a difficult person to work with, I, I should thank my wife, Elaine, uh, and my two kids, Alexander and Zachary, for tolerating me. Um, undoubtedly, uh, I couldn't do anything without their without their love and support, uh, and that of my parents, of course, as well. But, um, you know, I actually don't consider myself a difficult person. I'm probably a difficult person to be opposing counsel to, um, which is sort of by design, you might say. Um, but, you know, uh, the way that I conduct myself as a leader is – um, you know, is that I try to inspire by, by my own actions. You know, I try to give my staff, for example, at my law firm who are brilliant, um, you know, the ability to run, you know, full speed ahead, uh, and obviously being direct touch with clients and to do all of that critical work. You know, I know there's only so much I can do with my time and my day, and I desperately need to rely on others substantially. Uh, and, you know, I, I, 
govern all of my work by the idea of the best idea should reign supreme. It doesn't matter where it comes from or who has it, right? Whether at the very top or the bottom of any particular hierarchy. Uh, and similarly, um, it's, it's critically important to share credit and to give credit where credit is due. Uh, and so I, I think, uh, I'd like to think uh, that I, um, you know, we've had now at my law firm for the decade, I've run it, you know, more than 50 interns and externs, and we've had consistently positive feedback. But uh, I guess um, just very quickly, I know we're out of time. Uh, uh, I actually am uh, working with Orlando Bloom, uh, the, the actor uh, and producer on uh, actually a television series, uh, episodic drama for Amazon um, Studios, which is for Prime Video, which has 150 million viewers worldwide. And this is going to be a television show about a far more handsome and dashing human rights lawyer than me, uh, fictionalized, based in Washington that travels the world freeing political prisoners. So as I was joking, when we were pitching Amazon, ultimately successful to decide to make this show, um, I said it would be a lot easier for me to get uh, fake prisoners out of fake jails working on the writing team uh, as compared to getting real ones out of real jails. So uh, it'll be a nice change of pace and a, an opportunity to expose the issues that I care so much about to a much, much wider audience. Uh, that isn't a specialized human rights audience. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening. Now it's your turn. Tell us what you think. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergprize.org. Thanks again, and most importantly, don't forget to nominate a leader whose work deserves to be recognized and imitated. This podcast brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation.